Uh, this morning, we are looking at uh, a topical study, so it won't be uh, necessarily exegetical. I just want to draw uh, one point from a passage in Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2. And I think you'll see it. It comes as the, the, uh, the last statement that um, the Lord makes through Isaiah. This is what we read. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. May the Lord bless his, his word to our understanding this morning. Again, the idea here is um, th this idea of trembling. You know, we, I, I know that uh, Dr. Reeves was seeking to explain that to us when he talked about how the Lord Jesus Christ would be somebody who delights in the fear of the Lord. And that doesn't mean that Jesus walked, uh, as it were, terrorized at all times, you know, through this world afraid that his father was going to, you know, drop the hammer on him. That's not what that means, but as he was pointing out, that there is this, well, this intensity of love that, um, it, it, I guess it's hard to explain, but this reverence, this holy fear that we have of God gives sort of a, um, an intensity <laughs> to everything we do, intensity to our love, intensity to our regard for His Word, and I think that's what he's referring to here, uh, that we that we take it very seriously, understand what it is that it is, and that we receive it, we immerse ourselves in it. That's the only way we're actually going to be able to become like Jesus, uh, who, again, loved the Lord with a perfect love and loved his neighbor. Okay, well, as I've mentioned already, Christianity is, is all about love, and that's what we've been looking at. It was for love, love's sake, that... The Father chose us and sent His Son into the world for us. It's, it's out of love Jesus came and laid down His life for us and rose again that He might actually redeem us and reconcile us to the Father. It's, it's why the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to apply Christ to us and to, um, well, actually to bring about this particular work that the Spirit brings about. And, Again, if I had time, I would explain how Jonathan Edwards sees the Holy Spirit as the love that the Father has for the Son and that the Son has for the Father breathed out towards each other and how He gives us that love and puts it in our hearts so that we might love them and love like them and love one another as they love each other as well. But that's why the Father did all that He did, why Jesus did what He did, why He gives us the Spirit, is that He might bring this transformation about so that we might become just like Jesus. But now last week, remember, we saw that, that receiving the Spirit, um, this love, this desire for Him that allows us to trust in Jesus in the first place and to be justified, that that is really just the beginning you know, it's not the end. A lot of people see that as the end. You know, Christians, I'm saved and that's it. Just kind of go on and live the way I used to, but now I know I'm going to heaven and not to hell, and that's really what Christianity is. Well, no, that's, that's just the beginning. Now we need to work to, to grow into the image of Christ or to grow in this love. So the Spirit sovereignly gives us this love, but we are called upon to nurture it. Paul writes in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. By the way, we're going to uh, begin this evening a series on the book of James. And you know one of the overarching themes there is that um, true saving faith is, is not alone, but it's always accompanied by works. Now, one thing we have to be careful to, not to do as we read this passage from Paul is understand this as him saying, work out your justification with fear and trembling. Salvation is a much broader term than justification. Justification is God's declaration that we are just. 
that, that we're righteous in Christ and that we are accepted by him. Salvation is everything from the beginning to the end and even into eternity of what God does for us. And this is really referring to our sanctification. Okay, work out this growth in the image of Christ with fear and trembling. Notice with this kind of intensity. For God is at work in you by his Holy Spirit. But you have to, I have to, also do some work. Okay, this is a cooperative effort. So what are we supposed to do? Well, we start at the very beginning, which is, first of all, we do need to believe, we need to be convinced that God is real, okay, that these things are real. We're never going to pursue these things if we don't believe that they're, they're you know, actually, that, that this is reality. That's why the author to the Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 11, verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Now, think about this. If you don't believe God exists, if you don't believe that Jesus exists, or if you've got doubt in your mind, you know, are you ever going to do that very hard work of denying yourself that Jesus calls you know, all of us to do? Are we going to take up our crosses are we going to put our sinful desires to death? Are we going to seek Him and serve Him with our whole heart and life if we're not convinced? See, any doubt that we have is going to hold us back. We need to be as certain as we can possibly be. And if I were to ask you, how certain was Jesus of the existence of God? Well, you say, well, that's not fair because Jesus is God in human flesh. That's true. He is a divine person. Uh, and he was aware of the fact that he was with the Father forever in heaven. And boy, if we had time to get into this you know, topic, this would be interesting as well. But Jesus also you know, came into this world with the mind of an infant and, and then a toddler and then a child. And he grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Uh, he, didn't, he, you know, he didn't walk on this earth with infinite knowledge, with, with just this total awareness of his divinity but it's something that it was revealed to him little by little. The idea is that Jesus is fully man and he experiences everything that we experience as well. So that was even something that grew on him, you know. And he became more fully aware of and began to pursue with all of his heart, okay. So he was, and so knowing that that was the case, he constantly walked in the presence of his father, focusing his whole life on serving and pleasing Him. And if we are to be like Him, we really have to have more of the sense of His presence. Now, if that gives you any concern, what I just said, make sure you talk to me afterwards. But it is true that Jesus did grow. I remember in um, seminary, hearing that for the first time, my professor saying, you know, there was a point in time where Jesus realized that He was the Messiah. <laughs> You know, early on, he, he wasn't contemplating the secrets of the universe in the womb, you know. Otherwise, how could he be said to be growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man? Okay, so that's something he grew in, his understanding. Now, the question is, how can we do that? Well, we saw last week we need to resist our enemies that are trying to distract us, and that would be, of course, the world, which is constantly, you know, vying for our affections our flesh, which wants us to go that direction, the enemy who's dangling those baits in front of us. And by the way, you know, that idea of um, Satan being the master fisherman and knowing how to bait his hooks to, to, to hook us, that comes from uh, Thomas Brooks' book, you know, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. So maybe a plug for that, that particular work. But it's working to take our eyes off of God and to make him less real than he is, you know, so it's working against us. These enemies are working against us. So we need to resist them, put those things to death, put those desires to death, but we also need to focus on the ways in which God reveals himself. And I'm afraid I can't go through all the things we looked at, but he does it in the creation. Again, you know, we refer to those many handouts that we had during the uh, a series on apologetics, but he especially reveals himself through special revelation, okay? We need to immerse ourselves in that 
Revelation. We need to read it. We need to believe it. We need to understand it. We need to apply it. And we need to be convinced. You see, this is the key. We not only need to be convinced that God exists, but we need to, to know that He has spoken and that His words are inscripturated for us in the Bible. So here we have an opportunity to review that second section of the uh, apologetic series, only briefly though, because I don't want to take away from the main point, which is we need to be immersed in the Word. But how can we know that the Bible is the Word of God? Well, again, we looked at this when we were studying apologetics, but here are perhaps some of the main things, okay? We know that God is, and we know that He is personal. We know that He can speak, okay? How do we know that? Well, because we are personal and we can speak, okay? And we know from the law of cause and effect that whatever caused us has to at least have what we have. So we know that He's personal, we know that He has language. And we should assume that God made us with this ability to be able to speak uh, so that He could speak to us. And by the way, that is why God made us in His image. You know, why we share those various attributes is because God wants to reveal Himself to us. He wants to show us what He's like so that we'll marvel at Him, so that we will love Him, so that we will worship Him. Well, we couldn't do that unless we were like Him, okay? So He speaks to us. He not only can speak to us, He has spoken to us. And to make sure that we knew that He was the one who was speaking, He did certain things to distinguish what He said from what everyone else is claiming to be a word from Him. And again, if you've been you know, with us on the Wednesday night study, we've been looking at um, Islam and they believe God has spoken through the Quran, the recitations. But how do we know? You know, how do we know that um, God has spoken through the Bible, but not through the Quran? And it's really two main things. There's a number of things, but these two main things, prophecy and miracle. There's really nothing prophetic in the, book of, in the Quran, and there are no miracles that are recorded. They believe the Quran itself is a miracle, okay? Well, we might argue with that, but um, it certainly does not do what the miracles that God performed actually does, right? Now, only God can tell us what's going to happen in the future. He can do that because He knows the future. He knows the future because He has infinite knowledge. Only God does. And He alone also knows what He has planned that he is actually going to do or allow to take place through the actions of his creatures. So only God can tell us the future. And only God who created this world, this universe, and put into it the laws that he has, what we call the laws of nature, which is simply his ordinary way of doing things, right? It's, it's uh, providence. Only he can set those aside and do things contrary to those laws um, he can, you know, violate them, so to speak. He can work above them. He can do whatever he wants to do. But when he does, by the way, when he does, it's so amazing that it stops traffic and instills fear into the hearts of those who see it, something I would say the Quran does not do. Now, we saw several examples in our series. I would encourage you to review the handouts, but let me just give you two. Here's a simple one from Jesus, Okay. And a prophecy that he used to identify himself as the Messiah in John 13, verses 18 through 19. Um, he's talking about um, his disciples and who it is that belongs to him. He says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am He. Now, it's questionable what He meant by that. It can mean only one of two things, that I am the Messiah or that I'm God, okay? We know it means both with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ, but notice He tells them before it happens so that when it happens, they would be convinced that He is, in fact, who He said He was. 
Now, secondly, he also used miracles to identify himself as God's messenger. And as a matter of fact, that message got through pretty early on. Even an unbeliever, an unbelieving Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus saw and knew what those things meant. John 3, verses 1 and 2. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. See, the, the kinds of miracles that they did were not tricks like the magicians in Egypt, you know, who were trying to mimic what Moses was doing. These things were so clear and obvious that anyone who, who looked at them objectively would know that God was with this person. Now, we know that there are many different ways that the, that the Bible shows itself to be the Word of God, but these are perhaps the two most powerful. Jesus predicted the future. By the way, the Old Testament prophets did the same thing, didn't they? But he was right about his betrayal. He was right about his condemnation. He was right about his crucifixion. He was right about his resurrection. And let's not forget, perhaps, the, uh, the easiest one to demonstrate he was right about 70 A.D., okay? The Olivet Discourse, Jesus predicted exactly what was going to happen 40 years before it took place, and it happened again precisely as he said it would. And I don't think there's any question about the date when, when those things were written and the date when um, those things actually took place, and they were written at least... Uh, at least a good 15 to 20 years before, because remember the Gospels, they weren't recorded until, you know, a little bit later than Jesus actually died. He also performed many miracles, okay? He healed the lame, cleansed the lepers, gave sight to the blind, he raised the dead. And how do we know he did these things? It's because there were many eyewitnesses who saw what he did, who heard what he did, or heard what he said, and wrote those things down. And we have those records in the Gospels. And let's not forget Luke's Gospel, even though he was not an eyewitness. He talked to many eyewitnesses. So it's really the collection of many uh, testimony, many witnesses who saw these things, and he wrote them down uh, for Theophilus uh, so that he might know exactly what Jesus said and what Jesus did so that he might know who Jesus was. Well, these things prove that Jesus was sent from God. He is a prophet. He is the Messiah. And we know Jesus tells us that the, the, the law, the prophets and the writings, the whole Old Testament are Scripture. They're the Word of God. They cannot be broken. He tells us that He speaks the Word of God, you know, because He says only what the Father tells Him. And He said His apostles would write down God's Word. So essentially, Jesus is telling us the whole Bible is the Word of God, but we also know He gave us the Holy Spirit as believers to confirm that these things are true. And by the way, the Spirit of God not only confirms that the Bible is His Word, the Holy Spirit is the one who shows us the holiness of God in the Scripture that draws our affections toward the Word so that we want to read it and we delight in what we see more than gold, we find it to be sweeter than, you know, the, dri the drippings of the honeycomb and so, so forth. But again, our subjective experience of the Word will depend largely on just how much our love for God has grown. Okay, so it's not necessarily going to be that way. There's some hard work we have to do. But anyway, second, knowing that we have God's Word, we do need to appreciate it, don't we? He's told us things in the Bible in his special revelation that we could never know from the creation. Again, as we, as we looked at R.C. Sproul's exposition of um, general revelation, we saw what John Gerstner said was true. He said there are uh, natural theologians, those who study general revelation, they can sometimes come to a fuller understanding and more accurate understanding of who and what God is than most Christians who read their Bible. Okay? And, and that is kind of sad. But we, we saw all those things that are actually revealed in the creation. 
And there are a number of things, you know, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, those things are all revealed, his invisible attributes, Paul says, that he is holy and just and good. He's given us this faculty of conscience that tells us whether we do right or wrong. It makes us feel guilty when we do what's wrong. And Paul says this revelation leaves us without excuse. We have no excuse for doubting. But special, or excuse me, general revelation cannot tell us how to get rid of our guilt. It cannot tell us anything about God's love and His mercy, that He's done anything to deal with our guilt problem in sending His Son. It doesn't tell us how we can come into a relationship with Him through faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. We can only learn about these things in His Word. And by the way, even though God gives to us in, in our conscience a revelation of, of what He loves and what He wants us to do, and we can learn from that, let's bear in mind what we read earlier from the, the Scripture readings this morning, how great a blessing it is to have a clearer revelation and explanation of those laws so that we can follow them, you know, so that we can love God by doing those things. These two things make the Bible our most valuable possession. Okay? It's something that is actually uh, much more precious, I think, than we, we typically think it to be. You know, Jesus asked his disciples on one occasion, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? What, what good would it do to possess the world and all of its riches only to die and to suffer forever in hell? Okay, the world is nothing compared to the value of our souls. Again, if I can quote Jonathan Edwards, he once said uh, that the, the damned in hell, and it's not a very pleasant thought, but the damned in hell would give the world if they could and the whole universe simply to reduce the punishment of their sins by one sin, okay? And, and that's likely true. Now, if they would do that, they see the value, you see, of it there. But if they would do that to reduce their sins just by one, what would we give for something that would show us how to get rid of all of them and to escape judgment altogether? See, the Bible tells us how we can come into this relationship through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It tells us how we can live the right way to honor Him. So it's no wonder that we read that the psalmist, David, and the author of Psalm 119 would look at the Scriptures as something that is more desirable than gold. And we should see it that way. We need to see it that way. Well, finally, having this treasure, of course, isn't enough, okay? Um, and appreciating it isn't really enough. We do need actually to read it, okay? We need to believe it. We need to follow it. Now, there's a lot of things we need to do, but we need to get into the Word of God. Now, the Bible, as you probably know, is the best-selling book of all time, isn't it? There's, there's, I think in 1995, the statistic was 5 billion copies had been sold, now, I don't know if that included the, the copies that were given away. Maybe, maybe it did. But I would say that there is likely in just about everyone's households, probably in America and maybe many countries, that there's a Bible somewhere in their house. And, you know, the Gideons are working overtime to, to try to make sure more of them are distributed. There's Bibles in, in just about every hotel room in, in America. But the problem is not a lack of Bibles, okay, the problem is that there's very few people who actually read those Bibles. And I think we understand that as long as our Bibles sit on the shelf or lay on the table, they're really not going to do us any good. You know, we, we need to read them. Now, we should ask ourselves this question. How much do we actually read? Okay? How much have we read lately? You know, how much have we read of the Bible? You know, how much do we typically read in a day or in a week or in a month or perhaps even in a year? You know, some of us are, are reading through the Bible using, you know, the plan we're using or using another Bible reading uh, schedule. 
And so you are perhaps reading, uh, but we all need to read more because I think we recognize devotional studies that contain a few verses and some kind of a nice devotional thought can be helpful. Reading Christian literature can be good, systematic theologies, commentaries, sermons. But there's really no substitute for reading the Bible because that is how God speaks to us. That is how He is speaking to change us into Christ's image. You know, I, think about Sinclair Ferguson and his exposition of the creation and what was happening you know, during the creation week. The Father speaks, Christ is the word which is spoken, the Spirit of God hovering over the waters receives the word and then he transforms or, or orders the creation from being formless and void into this um, really well-formed and well-organized creation, which I believe he did in six days. Okay, but think about the process. Well, the same thing is going on in, in our lives, isn't it? As the Lord is speaking through his word and the Spirit of God is taking that word and he is transforming us, ordering our lives, take, moving it from being formless and void as we come into this world and making it to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there's no substitute for reading the Word. Now again, remember how we have these enemies that are trying to get us out of the Word. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're drawing our attention away from the Word into the world so that we won't think about God, we won't think about His kingdom, we won't think about or see things the way we should see them. The only way we can see through that deception is by getting our eyes back into the Word. We need to saturate our thinking with God's Word. This will keep us focused on God and His kingdom. Now, Martin Luther offers this advice. He, write, he, he writes this, You should diligently learn the Word of God and by no means imagine that you know it. Let him who is able to read take a psalm in the morning or some other chapter of Scripture and study it for a while. That is what I do. When I get up in the morning, I pray and recite the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer with my children, adding any one of the Psalms. I do this only to keep myself well acquainted with these matters. And I do not want to let the mildew of the notion grow that I know them well enough. Now, this is a person who practically memorized, I think, the entire New Testament and large portions of the Old. He did not want to think that he knew them well enough, so he was constantly in the Word. Now, he also tells us, as we read it, there is something we should be looking for. And if, I, if you knew Luther very well, you probably know the answer to this question, but he says this. He who would correctly and profitably read Scripture should see to it that he finds Christ in it. Then he finds life eternal without fail. On the other hand, if I do not so study and understand Moses and the prophets as to find that Christ came from heaven for the sake of my salvation, became man, suffered, died, was buried, rose and ascended into heaven so that through him I might enjoy reconciliation with God, forgiveness of all my sins, grace, righteousness, and life eternal, then my reading in Scripture is of no help whatsoever to my salvation. Well, I think he's got a point there, doesn't he? We need to find Christ. We need to understand everything in connection with him, either pointing towards him, showing us what he's like, or even telling us what kind of life he would live and how we should live. It's all about him. And then Luther ends with this warning. The neglect of Scripture, even by spiritual leaders, is one of the greatest evils in the world. Everything else, arts or literature, is pursued and practiced today, and, uh, excuse me, is pursued and practiced day and night. And there is no end of labor and effort. But Holy Scripture is neglected as though there were no need of it. But its words are not, as some think, mere literature. 
They are words of life, intended not for speculation and fancy, but for life and action. May Christ our Lord help us by his Spirit to love and honor his holy word with all our hearts. You know, I thought it's interesting. There's this one point where he says, Its words are not, as some think, mere literature. They are words of life intended not for speculation and fancy, but for life and action. Sometimes, you know, we, I think we spend maybe too much time trying to, you know, zoom off into those areas that um, Scripture maybe doesn't directly address and maybe isn't as important than simply understanding God wants us to have a relationship with Him, seek Him, pray to Him, seek Him for the salvation of others, live a life that is holy. Our minds are just way out here somewhere speculating, you know. The, the, the Bible is very practical. It, it tells us how we are to live, and that's what we need to be pursuing, Christ and Christ-likeness. Now, Luther learned a very important lesson at the end of his life. One of his regrets, as you may remember, was that he says, if I had to do it over again, I would spend less time reading the words of men and more time reading the words of God. So with whatever time we have left remaining to us, some of us have a lot, some of us have perhaps little, but we should read the Bible. Okay? We know the Bible is his word. We, we understand something of how precious it is. We have the Spirit of God. We know the Lord uses it to open our eyes and to keep them open to eternal things, the invisible things that we cannot see in the world. And we know that our enemies are trying to keep us out of it so that we will become blind. You see, all of these things are reasons why we should immerse ourselves in the Word. When Paul writes in Romans chapter 10, faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, he was talking about the beginning of our walk, but we understand that it still applies to every step in between. You know, faith is sustained. Faith is strengthened by reading the word of God. So let's read it. Let's meditate on it. Let's look for Christ in it. And let's let it stir our hearts up to, to live more for his glory. Because I think as we, as we see his love revealed in Scripture, and again are more and more convinced of the reality of that love, we are going to love him more and more. We can only do that by being in the word. Well, may the Lord again speak to us this morning through this and... Help us to, to, to do what he calls us to do. Let's, um, let's pray. Or spend a few minutes.